Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks, Andy. Uh, bit nervous, if I'm honest, so bear with me. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank uh, and take the opportunity to thank Andy Smith for giving me the um, chance to address you here all today. Uh, I met Andy at the, like I said, at the Game Changing in Mental Health uh, conference back in July this year. And uh, the conference itself was a, was a fascinating insight into how um, Great Britain's sporting bodies uh, were researching and trying to learn and cope with the increased mental health issues within their sports. Uh, that was my first foray into uh, public speaking on behalf of the Lawn Tennis Association. And uh, prior to that, the only public speaking engagement was at the lofty age of 12 at the debating society at Caster Grammar School, at which I delivered a four-sentence vote of thanks. So uh, forgive me for any mistakes I might make along the way. Um, the subject matter of my address today is slightly different to the speech that I made in July, which was solely about my own struggles with bipolar disorder. Um, you're probably all thinking, who's this guy and what's he doing up here? And I can all see that you're falling asleep a little bit after lunch, so I'm going to attempt to wake you up a bit with an honest account of uh, my life so far, um, much like, I don't think he's here now, Jake did um, so well earlier. Now, it says on your programme that I'm here to talk about raising mental health awareness in individual sports. And, however, I need to tell you about, a bit about my experiences first so that, I'm, so that you know that I ha I'm qualified to some extent to be talking to you today on this subject. I've always wanted to raise awareness surrounding mental health in tennis or, uh, tennis or sport in general, and this is my second um, big opportunity to do so. So here goes. So my name's Ollie Jones. I'm the head tennis coach at Brooklyn Sports Club in Sale in Manchester. I've coached tennis at Brooklyn's for five years, and in this time, uh, I've grown the programme from scratch to over 250 juniors per week and over 70 adults per week as well. Prior to my time at Brooklyn's, I was rackets manager at David Lloyd Warrington, aged just 21, and throughout my 10-year coaching career, I've worked with some of the country's national standard, national standard performance juniors. I'm certainly no celebrity, uh, but during my time at Brooklyn's, I've won um, the Aegon Coach of the Month Award twice. Works, excellent. Uh, won the Aegon Coach of the uh, Month Award twice, firstly in November 2010 and again in January 2012. The Aegon Coach of the Month Award is given to coaches who have been deemed to have made the greatest impact uh, to British tennis in that month. Uh, and I was also awarded the Up and Coming Coach of the Year by the Cheshire LTA in 2010. Um, in 2012, I was uh, diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Uh, but the truth is that I have been struggling with this illness for over a decade. And to be able to explain this to you in sufficient detail, I need to tell you a bit about my background. Now, I don't often admit this, but for my sins, I was born in Grimsby Town, North East Lincolnshire, 1982. And in 1984, just 18 months old, uh, my dad, who I did not know, committed suicide by hanging himself from a crane. My dad was born into an extremely academic family, his brother Mervyn, a biochemist, and his two sisters, Helen, a lecturer, and Margaret, a GP. It is widely thought that my dad suffered from bipolar disorder, but it was never diagnosed. Um, my auntie Margaret, being a GP, blames herself for not spotting the vital signs and therefore uh, not able to help. And I believe that if my dad had received the level of support that I have had, maybe he would still be here today. Sport has always played a huge part in my life and I took up playing tennis at the age of 10. Tennis has always been my greatest passion and remains so to this day and I, I'm very privileged to have had such a fortunate upbringing. Schooling wise I went to St Martin's Prep in Grimsby and Hymer's College in Hull, both private schools up until the age of 11. I then went to Caister Grammar School until I took my GCSEs and then on to, uh, to Repton School for my sixth form, one of the best tennis schools and indeed one of the best sporting schools in the country an incredible opportunity and one that I deeply cherish. As you can see, I've had a very happy and privileged childhood given to me by an extremely loving family. And despite what happened to my biological father, uh, despite what happened to my, my biological dad, 
at the age of, at the age of four, my mum met her second partner, Roger. They never married, but I treat him as my father and they had two children together. I have a beautiful younger sister, Grace, who is doing well in the music industry down in London. My second love is music after tennis. And she started to prove extremely useful in getting me some free tickets into gigs and festivals. I knew she'd be, I knew she'd be useful one day. My younger brother, Jack, is now a barrister in Nottingham. I left Repton with an A and two Bs at A-level and got a place to study at Leeds University Business School to read business management. And it was at Leeds that I started to feel the crippling symptoms of bipolar. It started off as bouts of depression that only lasted for a couple of days at a time. There seemed to be no pattern to the depression, but the, no pattern, but the depression was mild, often manifesting itself as a lack of energy, a lack of motivation. And, uh, and mild anxiety. I put these feelings down to normal university life and perhaps a little bit too much partying on my part. My stint at university was indeed a brief one. I didn't go into any lectures, any seminars, and I only attempted one of my first year exams. I was partying the whole year and having a whale of, an, uh, whale of a time ignoring all of the little brown envelopes from the university which were starting to pile up. I thought I was getting away with it, but little did I know that the same little brown envelopes were being delivered to my mum and Roger. This prompted some clear the air talks at Harvey Nichols restaurant in Leeds with my mum, which is where I decided to leave university and become a tennis coach. It was something that I'd done since I was 14, helping out at my club at St. James in Grimsby. Um, I also worked uh, for Jonathan Marks and at his tennis camps in Oxford in the summer holidays. And I also, I've also, co I also coached at... Um, Lou Hode's tennis club over in Spain. I pretty much fell into tennis coaching as I didn't see that I had any other options and it turns out to be the best decision that I've ever made. So at the age of 20 I went into tennis coaching as my full-time career. By this time I'd met Steph who I married four years later and I have two gorgeous children Lily and Wynne aged five and two respectively. Up until I was 25 the symptoms of bipolar became more frequent but I was able to manage them, but often under the pretense of another illness. I would tell people that I, have, that I had a stomach bug or flu symptoms, and on the odd occasions, I made up injuries to my ankle and back. I was too embarrassed to tell, uh, to tell anybody what was really wrong with me. And it was also around this time that the manic symptoms of bipolar were starting to affect me. Again, these symptoms were mild at the start and usually manifested themselves in a lack of sleep and huge amounts of energy. Over the course of the next five years, these bouts of depression and mania became more frequent, lasted longer, sometimes for a few weeks, and the symptoms were a lot more acute. By the age of 30, the illness had pretty much taken hold of me, and in the years of 2011 and 2012, I was barely stable. I had now realised that something was badly wrong, but was still too scared to talk to anybody and too scared to go to the doctors. I was worried and extremely frightened that I was turning into my dad. In the summer of 2012, depression, the depression had taken hold and had lasted for at least three months, but this time it was very, very different. My memory was completely shot often not being able to recall what I'd had for, for breakfast and forgetting what I was talking about mid-sentence. That still happens now. <laughs> um, I couldn't speak properly, my speech was slurry and often couldn't say what I wanted to do, to what, what I wanted to. My concentration had gone completely, often not being able to watch television as I couldn't remember what was happening. My coordination left me, often breaking glasses, cups, plates, etc but by far the most difficult and horrifying, frightening symptom was the new constant thought of committing suicide or running away. I just couldn't get these thoughts out of my head and they plagued me day and night. And I often found myself crying for hours at a time uncontrollably. I was a complete wreck and a mere shadow of my former self. And during this time, there were several occasions where I'd pack my bags in the middle of the night, ready to run away, 
And I found myself in my car thinking of the easiest ways to kill myself. Sorry. <laughs> it never gets any easier. <laughs> uh, at times, I'd been minutes away from driving my car into a wall, hanging myself, jumping off the Runcorn Bridge, or indeed taking an overdose of pills. I drank a lot of alcohol at this time, and it was the only thing that made these feelings go away. The only thing keeping me alive was the thought of what suicide would do to my children, and I didn't want to leave them as my dad had done with me and my mum. I realised that I had to do something about this, and otherwise Lily and Wynne were going to find themselves without a father, just as I had done. I went to the GP, he was very good, he gave me some antidepressants. Unfortunately, these made me worse. <laughs> And two weeks later, I got an appointment with the Warrington Mental Health Team. Uh, in July 2012, I was diagnosed with severe clinical depression, and they gave me the option of either going into hospital or, as we all preferred, daily visits by the Warrington Mental Health Team. Uh, sorry, where the Warrington Ment uh, Home Treatment Team. At this point, I hadn't been diagnosed with bipolar. I was still being treated for severe depression. My medication changed and I was, uh, I was prescribed fluoxetine, which is a different kind of antidepressant to the first one that they tried. And I was also prescribed Zopiclone, which is an extremely powerful uh, sleep drug, because I was really struggling with my sleep at the time. It really helped me sleep, and throughout the course of the following few weeks, somebody from the home treatment team came to see me every single day as their major concern was to stop me from committing suicide. The level of care that I received was truly wonderful. The home treatment team were available day and night and should I, should I need to contact them. After a few meetings with a psychiatrist, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And in the September of that year, I was prescribed quetiapin, a drug that has both mood stabilising and sedative properties to help me sleep. I did not work for five months in 2012. The symptoms of my illness were too severe. I eventually went back to work in the autumn of 2012, by which time the symptoms of depression had eased. And as soon as I went back to work, I was completely honest and open to everybody about my illness. I wanted to make a, dif I wanted to make a difference and was determined to try and help people that were suffering from the same symptoms as me. Most of the tennis fraternity were shocked that I was mentally ill as I'd managed to hide the symptoms so well over the years. In early 2013, I experienced my most severe manic episode in which I did some rather strange and spontaneous things. Uh, I spent money that I didn't have, like it was going out of fashion. Uh, I would often find myself doing the weekly shop at the big... If any of you know Warrington at all, it's a big Tesco Extra. I would often find myself doing the weekly shop in Tesco Extra at 2 a.m. in the morning. My behaviour became much more erratic, and it's a bit of an on-running joke now, but at one early morning Tesco trip resulted in me coming home with seven carrier bags full of mangoes. <laughs> and I don't think that I'd ever bought a mango in my life prior to this day. For around a month, I survived on as little as two hours of sleep. I was full of energy. I was at my most creative and generally loving life. But whilst others around me could see the erratic behaviour for what it was, I could not. My home life started to suffer and Steph and I started to fall out a lot, culminating in me moving out in October last year. I now live in Sale, a stone's throw away from the tennis club, and bar a couple of minor blips, I've been pretty stable since then. I've been at work constantly, and everything at Brooklyn's is thriving. 18 months on from being diagnosed with bipolar, my life, my, my life is now, actually it's two years, because this is a bit of the speech from down in London. It's two years from being diagnosed with bipolar, and my life is now very much different. I'm trying to enjoy the simple things in life, um, such as work, 
which I love. I'm very, very fortunate to have a job. I'm never going to be a millionaire, but I'm very fortunate to have a job that I absolutely love. And exercise. I'm playing lots of competitive tennis myself and I'm doing, uh, and doing lots of running also. Recently I completed the last leg of the Manchester Marathon, which, I was, uh, which was an amazing experience. I'm trying not to drink, despite one of these photos that you might see me drinking and I think. Um, I'm trying not to drink unless it's a special occasion. I see my children every weekend and I'm cherishing every single minute spent with them. And now I'm now a completely different person and long may it last. I'm sure that bipolar disorder will rear its ugly head at some point, but now, that I, now I know that I can beat it if it does. Now, one of the main reasons for me standing here today is the level of support that I've been shown by everybody at Brooklands and also by the LTA on both county and national scales. I need to pay special thanks to Caroline Yates, unfortunately she can't be here today, who's basically kept my business running and going throughout my absence and continues to do an amazing job with my admin today. Um, just to give you, it's not, this isn't this is bit ad-lib, to, to give you an idea of what the business is, I'm, I'm self-employed, um, but I have um, six tennis coaches that work for me at the, at the tennis club and uh, we, like I said, we have over 250 kids coming through per week, so it's the size of a small school. So the, the admin job on our hands is quite massive, and admin is not my strength. Um, so without Kaz, it, I, it, I would not have a business to come back to. Uh, the support from the Cheshire LTA on a local level has been incredible. I would like, I'd, I'd like to pay thanks to certain people, Nicky Harrison, Andy Wilkinson, Steve Lee, Lynn Whitford, all these you won't know, but they're superstars. Nicky would often come round to my house when I was depressed for a cuppa and often help me and, uh, help me and support me whilst I was depressed. I've worked for the LTA on, a numerous, on numerous occasions, and, it be, and be it on talent ID days or captaining junior county teams away at County Cup. Nikki used to tell me that whatever happened, she would be there for me and that my good relationship with the LTA remained intact and that they would offer support in any way that they, could, that they could, even if it was just to talk about how I was feeling. And talking is so important. Sorry, I don't usually cry. <laughs> My coaching team at Brooklands have also gone out of their way to cover coaching sessions for me when I've been poorly and the tennis committee have been a rock of support for me through the past few years. The parents of all the juniors on the coaching programme have also been incredible and their support has been unwavering. I'm extremely fortunate and very, very grateful. I'd also like to pay thanks to Simon Jones who sits on the executive committee of the, of the whole LTA. Um, he's the head of performance support at the LTA, and Simon is an ex extremely, extremely busy man. He leads, a performance, he leads the performance support teams, which include sports science and medicine, the talent team, and the performance centre network for tennis's governing body. And despite all of this, Simon finds time to meet me to discuss my health and my coaching. And for the last two years, Simon and I have met at Wimbledon during the championships for a catch-up, and Simon always offers his support and stresses that he would be extremely disappointed if I didn't call him when needed. And moving on to the, this is enough about me, moving on to the subject matter of raising mental health awareness in individual sports, I really struggled with this a little bit. So I thought Andy, Andy emailed me and said, what, what would you like to um, talk about? And uh, so I came back with this and actually then I went over to research it and it's an absolute minefield. So. This is what I came up with, not much. But moving, moving on to the subject matter of raising he uh, health awareness in individual sports, we need to understand the pressures that individual sportsmen and women go through and are under. They often lead solitary lifestyles, they travel alone, the financial pressures are huge, uh, and the obvious pressures of competing alone. The elite players, competitors in, in tennis, certainly often surround themselves, you see Andy Murray, often surround themselves with large support groups. However, those struggling to break through into the professional ranks do not have the, the financial capability to be able to do this. You actually only start making money, really, 
when you get to say 250 in the world, something like that, and that's just break, that's just breaking even. Uh, compared to uh, down in the conf uh, conference in London, compared to the golfer down at 250 in the world, is making about 80,000 pounds a year. So there's a huge disparity there. Uh, one of my friends talks of his time of, of whilst trying to make it as a professional tennis player. Dave, Dave Corey reached uh, 250 in the world in doubles and 300 in singles, so he's a bloody good player. Uh, I bumped into him at a tennis tournament in Ilkley in Yorkshire, uh, and I hadn't seen him since, uh, since sixth form, and this was in 2006. He had just qualified in economics, at uh, a university in Texas, in America. But not only this, he had been on a tennis scholarship there for four years, which is one route that tennis players can take. Uh, and the, the, it's, coming back, it's coming back into fashion a little, little bit more um, because the coaching at the American universities is now second to none and it's geared towards making tennis professionals. But to have a qualification as well, something to fall back on. Um, he was due to play in a futures event, uh, event in Bolton, and futures events are the lowest tier of professional tennis tournaments. So these, these events often have like a $10,000 10, purse to them, but that's the total prize money. So if you lose in the first round, you get 25 quid. But it's not much. Um, he asked me if he'd be able to stay with us in Warrington, and uh, as it would save him some money, I hadn't, seen him, I hadn't seen him for years, and it was such a great, great way of catching up, and it was fascinating to hear the ins and outs of the lower level professional tour. Dave said that when they were not playing tennis, it was an extremely lonely place with very little to do. They travelled to all corners of the globe, and in, t in particular to some unsavoury places, to try and build their world ranking points. They received very little support financially, so they couldn't really go sightseeing or partake in any sort of touristy activities. So they were, they were confined mostly to their hotel or hostel room to watch DVDs. He mentioned that it was a very lonely place on court as well, and that was eight years ago. Um, he mentioned even then that he believed there were huge amounts of mental health issues bubbling under the surface. Individual sports are very different to team sports in that from a very young age there is a feeling of camaraderie and support from your teammates and coaching staff. To an extent there is some camaraderie in the individual sports but in the main you are all competing against each other. My main interest is obviously in tennis but as you know there are many more individual sports out there and it wouldn't be right of me to fo focus solely on tennis. So the big question is how do we raise awareness within sport and specifically individual sports. Uh, the obvious way is to get high profile names to speak out about it, uh, about their battles with mental health. Some of the high profile celebrity sportsmen and women, now when I researched this, and some that I wasn't aware of, um, that have spoken out in the last 20 years are double Olympic champion athlete Dame Kelly Holmes, footballers David Beckham and Paul Gascoigne, Rugby players, Johnny Wilkinson and Jason Robinson. Cricketers, Marcus Truscothic and Freddie Flintoff. Olympic champion cyclist, Victoria Pendleton. Olympic champion swimmers, Rebecca, uh, Rebecca Adlington and Ian Thorpe. Tennis legend, and surprisingly to me, Serena Williams. I didn't know this. And I'm a tennis coach and I'm heavily involved in tennis. And Serena Williams has apparently, and she has, but it's, you, you, have to, you have to trawl down Google to find it, which is unbelievable, suffered with depression when coming back from illness. I think we all know about the world champion boxers Ricky Hatton and Frank Bruno. This, is, this however, is a very difficult thing to expect of high level athletes when there is such a stigma, we've already heard about stigma, still attached to mental health, and in the main part, athletes are just em are embarrassed to talk about mental health related issues. The only way to, in my mind, the only way to break the stigma is to keep talking about mental health and give everybody, not just the elite athletes, the opportunity to do so. I believe that sport has a huge part to play in breaking down this stigma. If I've read the figures correctly, my maths isn't good. The most recent sport, the, sorry, the most recent Sport England survey shows that nearly 16 million people aged 16 and over 
take part in a moderate sporting activity at least once a week. Another survey that I researched found, and I think the figure was up earlier on, found that one in four people in the UK will suffer from mental health Ill, uh, will, will suffer from a mental illness this year. And so if we apply that figure to the people that play sport regularly, raising mental health awareness in sport and increasing the support networks and infrastructure, the sporting bodies could help up to four million people suffering from mental illness. Now I'm certainly not a professor, as some of you are, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist, and all that I can do is relate this to my own experiences. Um, I only found that there was support was there, I only found that the support was there because I physically, I told people about my illness and I was open and honest about it. I don't need to hide anymore. I don't need to tell people that I've got the flu or that I've got the stomach bug. Everybody around me is aware that sometimes I might be depressed or hypermanic and, and that this is just a part of me and that the likelihood is it's not, never going to go away. The only way that I can see to, su to support everyday people playing sport and also the elite athletes out there is to have fundamental support networks in every single sporting body. If somebody breaks a bone or tears a muscle playing sport, there's support there for them. You can turn around immediately, there's support there for you. If someone is feeling depressed, the same level of excellent medical support should be there for the sporting public to access. It, looks like, it does look like, from being here today, it looks like we're, ma we're making progress in this and I urge all of the policymakers out there and the medical professionals within sport in this country to keep this progress going. Now, the one area that I haven't covered in my quest to raise mental health awareness in sport, now you're going to have to bear with me for this bit, is the colossal weight of social media. Sorry, the colossal weight of the social media platform, and this leads me nicely into my final point. Now, you really might think I'm an utter after this. And I've had an idea of how we can make a difference right here, today, in both raising awareness and also raising funds. I, wasn't, I was umming and ahhing whether to do this bit or not, but I'm going to do it. Um, so, I'm sure everybody here is aware of the Ice Bucket Challenge, correct? Yes? Good. And we're all aware of what the ALS Motor Neuro, uh, what, uh, what, uh, what it did for ALS, also known as Motor Neurone's Disease, especially on, especially on Facebook. Now, don't panic. I'm not going to make everybody pour icy cold water all over their heads, as hilarious as that would be. I don't think it's the right time of year and I don't think you've all brought a change of clothes. No, but the ice, in all seriousness, the Ice Bucket Challenge raised over $100 million. And who knows, I don't know if this is going to raise anywhere near the amount, but here goes. I mentioned earlier that my, one of my loves is music. Even if you don't follow music like I do, everybody has a song that makes them smile. Right? Can everybody think? Maybe not everybody. Hopefully everybody's got a song that can make them smile. Well, what I propose to you is that, with it being World Mental Health Day tomorrow, who's got a Facebook account? Can I just a quick show of hands who's got a Facebook account? Marvellous. Right. So what I'd like you to do, and I'm going to do it in a minute, um, I'd like you, so using YouTube or using Spotify, something like that, I'd like you to post a song online on Facebook that makes you, the individual, smile or that makes you happy. Okay, bear with me. So what I'd like you to do, so if you have Facebook, so you post a song online that makes you smile and makes you happy and what you do, much like the ALS challenge, you nominate some of your Facebook friends to do the same and they in turn have to nominate theirs each time posting a song from YouTube or Spotify or elsewhere that makes them smile. 
Every time they do this, they can donate to a mental health charity of their choice by going to either just giving page or I'm going to donate, I'm going to, I'm in a minute, I'm going to do this. The first time I've done it is going to, I'm going to donate to Mind. Okay, so Mind, I, the, the reason I've chosen Mind is because I've got some links with them already. So I pro I, what I propose is that you donate, uh, sorry, it's a bit out of left field, I apologise. I propose that you donate the equivalent amount of money to the time that the song lasts. For example, if the song lasts three minutes and 15 seconds, you donate three pounds 15. Or, if that's too complicated, um, you can provide the text number on Facebook to your preferred mental health charity. So uh, I'm gonna sound like Anton Deck now. If you text the word support to 70660, this will donate three pound directly to mind. Now, I've got a couple of friends in the music industry, including my, including my younger sister, who may be able to get a bit of momentum behind this. Now, um, so this is including my best friend's younger brother. You won't have heard of him now, but I can guarantee you, you will do in a few months. His name is Nick Gardner, and he's about to go on an imminent European tour supporting Maroon 5, culminating in a gig at Wembley in, uh, Wembley, uh, yeah, at Wembley in just July next year. So Nick is going to do his best with this, as he shot to fame by receiving only one million hits on YouTube for a cover of an Adele track, if that means anything to you at all. And e even if it never gets past this room, at least we could make a few hundred quid, right? So, and with the power of technology and social media, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to raise awareness and make some money for Mind using just my phone. And I hope you will join me and nominate others to do so. Thank you very, very much for listening.